Richari, last time we, uh, we interviewed you, which was in Durban last year, you said you were worried that there was a lack of urgency in the negotiations. Has anything changed? Well, I think it's a little too early to tell because the COP has just begun. And I think it will probably pick up momentum uh, in the second week. But the point that I've made to uh, the delegates in the speech that I gave is essentially to see the scientific reality of inaction and what this will lead to in terms of impacts and the kinds of threats it's going to pose and the risks it's going to impose on different parts of the world and the attractiveness of action. So I think if um, the delegates over here focus on these issues, I think it may raise their level of ambition and we should be able to take a few steps forward beyond where we are today. I think there's a whole range of unresolved issues and I think they shouldn't postpone it any further. They should really sort of catch the bull by the horns and uh, come to decisions. That's what the world expects of them. We've heard so much over the past, particularly the past month, um, reports from PricewaterhouseCoopers saying the world is on a trajectory for six degrees. Uh, the IEA have said it might be four, two degrees. Um, your predecessor, Bob Watson, has already said we've probably blown in our chances of, of doing that. But you're the, you're, the, you're the sort of head man here, so can you give us your assessment of, of where you think we are currently heading for? Well, timing is very important, and obviously if we're going to continue without taking any action, without mitigation at any level at all, then obviously there is the possibility of our going up to the upper end of the scale and the range that we've projected. I'm not too sure whether we can jump to conclusions on the basis of the past five or six years or ten years uh, that sort of get extrapolated to the end of the century. But that possibility is there because in the fourth assessment report we clearly brought out the fact that if mitigation doesn't take place, then the upper end of the range that we projected as temperature increases by the end of the century is 6.4 degrees Celsius. And surely that is going to be a major catastrophe, a series of catastrophes. So nobody in his right senses would want to move along that trajectory. Is this a matter of, matter of um, political will, do you feel, more than the, the negotiators? Because many of the negotiators here, I guess, have come to many of these conferences and they will be well aware of the climate science. Are these the ones who are really matter or is it actually you know, politicians back home are the ones who have to have this drummed into them? I think what's going to be crucially important is the awareness of the public, particularly in democracies, because that's the only way that you create political will. I mean, it's uh, the public that's going to demand actions. And I suppose that raises the importance of uh, creating awareness among the public and you know the media is an extremely important part to play in this. Mm. Once you have uh, political will in terms of action at the national and sub-national level then I've no doubt that will also percolate into the discussions that are taking place in the COPs mm -hmm. and hopefully that will lead to an agreement. And is it time for the IPCC to focus more on regional areas as opposed to giving us your sort of global reports and focusing perhaps country by country. Um, I was recently in India and you know clearly India is, is facing increasing environmental problems. Is it time for a real focus on individual countries as opposed to these rather larger reports that you produce? Well we are even in the next fifth assessment report uh, going to focus uh, substantially on regions because uh, we realize that you know particularly in respect of impacts uh, and vulnerability that's going to be crucial unless you provide regional detail then merely looking at the aggregate at the global level doesn't make any sense for someone who's living in a particular part of a vulnerable region but that's also true of mitigation because it's not a case of one size fits all we need to look at the institutional capacity we need to look at the extent of emissions that are being generated in a particular area so indeed in the next assessment report, we'll have much greater regional detail. So we're definitely dealing with this uh, challenge. And the next assessment report, I understand the first part of it is out next year. Um, how much of that is going to focus on the need to increase adaptation 
um, because if, if what we hear from scientists is correct, we're already going to experience some of the effects of climate change. So what focus can you tell us is going to be on that? Well, uh, I think the focus on adaptation really comes from the Working Group 2 report. Uh, the Working Group 1 report is going to give us answers to scientific projections of what's going to happen to increase in temperature, other climate-related phenomena, what's going to happen to sea level rise, and also, you know, some degree of uh, assessment of how this is going to impact on different regions of the world. But all that information is then sort of translated into impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability in the Working Group 2 report. So I think that's really where we're going to get uh, answers to how much to adapt and how to adapt. So that really comes from the Working Group 2 report, not the Working Group 1 report. And when you hear um, discussions, uh, countries saying they do not have enough money to provide finance for mitigation and adaptation efforts, given the potential effects of climate change, what would be your message to those world leaders in terms of you know, assessing their priorities? Well, my message would be the scientific message because the impacts are going to be most severe on those who are most vulnerable. And the ones who are vulnerable are already living under a multiplicity of stresses. And climate change is only going to exacerbate those stresses and could possibly reach tipping points in social systems and ecosystems and the whole sort of cultural ethos of a society. And I think we need to keep that in mind and if the world realizes that anything that happens in any part of the globe is going to affect all of us, we need to treat this as a kind of risk management challenge and as buying out insurance, so to speak. And I hope that message goes home to leaders in the richer nations of the world. This is something which is enshrined in the framework convention on climate change. It's something that we are dealing with even in the fifth assessment report because you have to look at societal impacts. It's not just enough to look at science and technology in a very narrow sense. So that would be my message. Look at the reality of what's going to happen in different parts of the world and then see how one might be able to minimize risks, not only for those communities, but on a much larger scale, regionally and globally. In terms of communicating the importance of, of change now, how do you do that to a country which is based on fossil fuels and whose Deputy Prime Minister, who is the COP18 President, is, a, is whatever he says, he, he's backing fossil fuels to help their country develop over the next decades? Well, I would say that firstly, since uh, Qatar is hosting this conference, they obviously have a deep interest in the subject. The other issue is that <clears throat> the other issue is that they are also going to be vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So they are, and I'm sure, will become even more conscious of this reality. Secondly, we must remember that it's not just resources below the ground. They have substantial resources above the ground. Look at the amount of solar insulation that this country gets. Uh, there might be locations where wind energy would have an enormous potential. So if gas resources in Qatar are going to last 300 years, why wouldn't they want to extend it to 600 years and utilize more viable and more attractive technologies on the ground? So I think if they strategize what would be best in the long run for this society, I'm sure they would move to um, a very different uh, mix of energy supply in the future as well. Two more, two more questions. The first is that there are still fierce debates, which I know you're well aware of, about, about climate science. Um, as far as you're concerned, is, is, is the matter settled? Is there, is there any doubt, are there any doubts that we can have about what we know already about carbon emissions having increased in the world warming? Well, it's settled in the sense that, uh, you know, you have an overwhelming majority of scientists and a substantial and convincing amount of scientific material which tells you what the truth is. There'll always be a few who are going to question it and doubt it. I mean, there are people, if I could draw an analogy, um, who still believe that there's no link between consumption of tobacco and, uh, and cancer. Uh, even though scientifically that issue has been settled 
ages ago. So, I mean, one has to accept the fact that not everybody on this planet is going to agree to even something which is totally convincing. But the reality is that maybe 95 or 98 percent of the scientists and more and more of the rational public now believe that climate change is for real. And uh, therefore, we just have to get on with our job and do the best we can. And those who doubt it, well, more power to them. Let them enjoy themselves. And you seem quite a calm individual um, who uh, gets on with life. But are you worried when you look at all the reports, when you look at the preliminary reports you're getting from AR5? Are you, are you a worried man that there is no action here, and yet the science is giving us, appears to be giving us, more and more doom-laden predictions? I'm an optimist and I believe that uh, by and large human beings are risk averters. Once they realize the, the risks of inaction, then I think you will see a snowballing of activities all over the world. And uh, perhaps then we'll move on the right path. But in the meantime, of course, damage will be done. Impacts of climate change will become more serious. And therefore, time certainly is of the essence. Adequacy of action is also of the essence. And I hope human society realizes that they don't have too much time to waste. How, mu how much time we have? A week and a half left here. How, how much time do we have? Well, you know, in the fourth assessment report, we had assessed that if you want to, say, limit temperature increase to 2 degrees to 2.5 degrees Celsius at least possible cost, then CO2 emissions will have to peak no later than 2015. So that's just three years away, or getting close to two years away. So um, if the world wants to do this at least possible cost and minimize or avoid or delay the impacts of climate change, then the sooner they move, the better. Because what we do today will have major implications 10, 15, 20 years into the future.